So in today's video, guys, we are gonna go over this guy inside and out, and I'm also gonna cover some things about this that a lot of people haven't mentioned in their videos. And then we're gonna see how it shapes up and compare it to some other handguns that are available right now to see if this might be the best handgun of 2023 or not. Welcome back, party people. Hope you guys are doing awesome today. So based on the guns that have come out recently from Springfield, whether it be the Echelon that just came out or the Springfield Prodigies that came out at the end of 2022, I will say this, regardless of what you think about them or their guns, they're doing something quite right. When you first look at the Echelon, at first glance, it looks like a Glock, a P320, a CZ P10C mixed in with a little Strike Industries. They all came together and made a baby. And at first glance, it looks like all they did was they simply took the best features from each of those platforms and incorporated them into one single firearm. However, when you start looking at this gun a lot closer, you start to see that not only did they take some of those ideas and meld them into together into one firearm, but they also improved upon some of those ideas. For example, the overall shape and size of the Echelon looks very similar to that of the Glock 17, except they made a lot of tweaks like adding better sights, making it more ergonomic, better grip texture, a better light rail, and gave it better controls that are ambi. Then when you look at it and compare it to the P320, it looks like it's a rip off of that because the P320 has a fire control unit that is the serialized part of the gun and then the grip is separate. And so when you look at it at first, it looks like they copied them. Now, yeah, they did borrow that idea, but they made some tweaks to it. Number one, they gave it a much lower bore axis than the P320. One of my my biggest complaints about the P320 was always the bore axis. I hated how high it was. I hated the way the guns felt. I've never been the biggest P320 fan despite owning a couple of them. They also added a thumb ledge to the takedown pin, which never came stock on the P320s. You usually had to go buy something from the aftermarket if you wanted to get a ledge, but that also came with trade-offs. But the other thing they did, you'll notice, is they added a tab to the trigger shoe. And that's gonna be very important later on in the video. Now, if you look at the grip and compare that to the CZ P10C, it almost looks like they copied that, right? Like the overall shape and design of the grip looks almost the same, except they added a couple of other features. They gave it way better grip texture. I've never been a fan of the grip texture of the P10Cs. I never felt like they had enough of it. But with this one, I feel like they did a great job. And then they did take another feature from the P10C, which is a fully ambidextrous magazine release. And I'm just getting to the tip of the iceberg of what they did to this gun. Now, one thing you should know right off the bat before we get too far into this video is yes, Springfield Armory sent me this gun. No, Springfield Armory did not pay me to make this video, nor do they have any type of say in what my opinions are. I wanna make something very clear. Just because someone sends out a gun for me to test and review, that doesn't make me automatically wanna give it a good review. And if you don't believe me, I want you to go watch this video right here. I just published this video a couple weeks ago and I got two guns in there. One of them cost 1500, the other one cost $2,500. And I didn't recommend those guns. And those guns were sent to me and they just fell apart. So my goal with the videos isn't to be a commercial. It's to just tell you what my experience is. And if a company happens to send it out for review, cool, if I happen to go buy it, it's also cool. Both guns get treated the same in the review. Also, another thing you should know is I will include a parts list for everything that you see in this video. So that way, if you're trying to find some things in stock, you will be able to find those very easily. The way you find a parts list is the first link in the description and I'll pin that link in the comments for you as well. I also want to say thank you to you guys on the past few videos for hitting the subscribe button because I've been telling you guys, hey, every time you hit the subscribe button on a video, what it does is it trips the algorithm to recommend these videos to people that have never been exposed to 2A content before. And I think that's one of the best ways on YouTube that we can help spread awareness and get people to go down the rabbit hole of getting into stuff like this. Not only does it help me out, uh, obviously helping the channel grow, but you might also help someone else out and help them save their life by helping them stumble into the world of 2A and guns. So one thing I wanted to know right off the bat are what are the actual benefits with a modular fire control unit? Now, in this case, only SIG calls it the fire control unit. In this one, it's called the central operating group or something like that, uh, called a COG. But what are the actual benefits of having something like that? The first benefit to having any type of fire control unit or modular frame system is different size grips that come from the factory. So this one here is the smaller grip, and I believe this is the medium grip, and then they also have a large grip. So you can simply pull that fire control unit out, slap it in here, 
bam, you got a different size grip. But the biggest benefit aside from that is because these aren't serialized, they are much cheaper than buying a serialized frame. For example, I believe these frames right now are about 50 to $60, depending on where you get them. I'll have some information over at the parts list. The other benefit to having some kind of fire control unit or cog system on a grip is if you've ever taken your Glock grip, mailed it off to a FFL to get some Cerakote work or some stipple work done to it. Because these are the serialized portions of the gun, they have to be overnighted. And overnighting a firearm can cost you upwards of 100 bucks or more, and that's on top of paying to get the Cerakote and or stipple job. The cool thing about having some kind of fire control unit is if you did want to get this retextured or get this Cerakoted, you can simply put this in the mailbox, and because it's not a gun, you can ship it any way you want and probably pay about five to $10. And so that's always a benefit. The other benefit is too, is it opens up the door for people who are not FFLs, but who know how to do stippling. So, you know, if you want to get like a Glock stippled or Cerakoted, it has to go to a FFL. But with these, because these are just hunks of plastic, anyone can do stippling to them and anyone can do Cerakote work to them. However, I think the biggest benefit to having these is it allows the aftermarket to respond. So like, this is an example of my P365 X Macro um, from the Icarus Precision Grip. Um, this is an example of the Zev OZ9 Icarus Precision Grip. Obviously the SIG has a modular chassis, but so does the OZ9. And what it does is it allows companies to make aftermarket upgraded grip modules and allows them to ship right to your house because they are not the serialized portion of the gun. The other benefit to having a modular fire control unit and different grip modules is you can change the size of your firearm without having to buy another firearm. And so because the serialized portion is completely disconnected, if you wanted to get a compact frame or maybe an extended dust covered frame so you can do a longer slide or a shorter dust covered uh, frame for a shorter slide, you can do so. Like an example would be, this is an Icarus Precision compact grip, but then Icarus Precision also makes a bigger grip, similar to like the Glock 19X that has a full size grip with a compact slide. So not only can you do it through the aftermarket, but you can also do it with factory parts as well. So now that we know the benefits of having some kind of modular grip system, let's talk about what the grip texture and the ergonomics on this guy feel like. The first thing that I noticed when I picked this guy up, when I gripped it, was it felt very similar to another gun that I own, which is the CZ P10C. Something I noticed about the P10C when I first picked it up was how well your webbing of your between your thumb and index finger would go up into that beaver tail. But I feel like the Prodigy has done a couple of things better than the P10C grip. Number one, they still have that same shape and design. When you look at them, you see how they're very, very similar. I will say the P10C's beaver tail does seem to go a little bit deeper than this one does, but if you look at the backside of them, you can actually see that they lowered the bore axis on here even more. So when you're gripping it here, the center of your bore is that high above your hand. And then when you grip this one, it's not quite as high because this beaver tail is thinner. The one thing I hate, didn't like about the P10C though, was it didn't have enough grip texture. The grip texture that's on it isn't bad. There's grip texture here. There's grip texture on the indexing points here, but they could have done so much better with this. And I feel like they did. So the texture on here feels very similar to a micro dot type texturing, similar to the Springfield Prodigy, but not the same. But they put this texture everywhere. Not only do you have it on the grip, but you also have it up here where your support hand rides. You also have it up here on the takedown pin. You also have it right here on this little thumb ledge and we'll cover those in a little more detail in a second. They also have texturing on the magazine release. They also have texturing under the double undercutted trigger guard and they have texturing right here on the front of the trigger guard in case you like to wrap your index finger. I don't have the OEM lever anywhere handy. I have it somewhere, I just can't find it at the moment, but none of the P320s ever came with a lever that was like this. This one adds a thumb ledge to it, but you had to buy these aftermarket. They didn't come with it. But on the Springfield Echelon, you do get one. It's not as aggressive as that one, but it can't be because the problem that I had with these types of levers was they wouldn't fit in any of my holsters. You had to get holsters specifically made for this. And so it's nice that they made the ergos right here where not only do you have a thumb ledge right here, but you could actually use the takedown lever as a thumb ledge because it's textured as well. Now, what if you don't like 
the actual ergonomics of this grip. Well, you can actually stick your finger down into the magwell and push a button and then your back strap comes off. In the box, I believe they come in sizes. They may have more available, but I have a pre-production model. Um, one of them is a large and one of them is a small. And then I also have a medium sized right here. For me, I like that rounded grip. So the large works good for me. And the other thing I noticed was they have this little tool right here. And so there's not really much you'd have to punch out of this to take it apart, except for maybe right here for this magazine release. They go on really easily. You just get that to go in the hole and then you kind of just hit it. And the way you take them out is you can't really see it, but down in here is a little notch and you can, you hear that and that makes it come loose. Really easy to change, I will say that. Now let's go over the trigger because that's always an important part in any handgun. Now there are a few unique things you need to know about this trigger. So if you've been paying attention for a while, you'll know that the P320 has had its fair share of problems with their trigger, meaning people were dropping these on the ground. I think back in 2018 that came out and they weren't drop safe. And then SIG issued a recall for people to send their fire control units back in. And some people claimed it got fixed. Some people claimed it didn't. Then in more recent times, we have multiple camera footage of police officers just walking around with these in their holster and them going off. So in order to counter that, Springfield added a trigger blade similar to that that we see on the Glocks. And what that does is even if this gun is dropped, this trigger can't be pushed back without touching that blade. So if you look at the P320 here, if I pull on the side, it doesn't matter. The other thing is the trigger feels really good in the hands. Here's the take up, here's the brake, Here's the reset, break. The reset isn't weak, it's just you don't really hear it and you don't really feel it as much either. Let me show you again. I would describe the break on here, it's more of a rolling break. And what I mean by that is when you get to the wall, it kind of feels like you're going over a speed hump, you know, like in a parking lot, whereas now this is an aftermarket trigger, but just to show you the differences, this has a crisp brake. And this would be similar to, instead of hitting a speed hump, you're running into a curb. It's not a bad thing like it would be hitting a curb, but to just explain it, that's just kind of how it feels. The pull weight on here is my favorite pull weight, which is around four and a half pounds, I believe. Let's do a quick test. Right there, I got 4.25 pounds. I've tested this multiple times. It comes out between four and a quarter and four and a half pounds. Moving on to the slide, there's a lot of things going on with the slide that I actually do like. If you look at the way the slide front serrations are, not only does it have good serrations for grabbing, it also kind of comes in at an angle as it gets more narrow. You can see a little shoulder right here. And what that does is when you are press checking, when you're doing press checks, it's not only easier, but for example, if you were press checking with the Glock, I have had the slide and then that would slam between the barrel and the slide and pinch the skin on my finger. It hurts. And so with this one, if it slides, look, that little ledge, it catches your finger and it won't pinch. A little, something very small, but something I just noticed and really do appreciate about it. The other thing I like about it is on the rear, you obviously, it does the same thing as it does on the front, it goes at an angle. You can see it better from the top right here. So you can see how it comes back. And so not only do you have serrations right here, but if your grip got lost, you have the back of the slide that will catch it right there. Now, the other thing that makes this gun very unique from any other gun is the way they do the optic system because it doesn't use optic plates. Earlier in the video, I said that this gun had some things borrowed from Strike Industries. And what that commonality is gonna be has to do with this modular optic systems or what Springfield's calling it the variable interface system. I'm not gonna take this off. I'm gonna throw some pictures up so you can see it. And then I wanna show you this one right here. This is a slide that I got a couple of years ago from Strike Industries. And this one has a very, very similar modular optic system. And it uses these little pins right here. And let me get them in there and you can see tiny little pins and they include a grip of them. You can put two here and two in the rear. It all depends on what optic you have. And then you have two little places, your threads to go in to secure the red dot. Now, the downside to these is 
Although I've never had them break, they are using little thin post right there. And I guess over time they could break I haven't put enough rounds through it to see if they would break, but I will say this, they're easy to lose. Now with the VIS system, what makes it very similar, they are also using pins, but you can see that these pins are much more robust than the Strike Industries pins. The other difference is with the Strike Industries pins, they just kind of sit into place. And then if you turn it over, they fall out. But with these, if you look at these guys closely enough, when you put them in, you turn them and they lock into place. So you don't really have to worry about them falling out unless you want them to actually come out. And in the box that I got, you actually get them for Delta Point Pro and Flex. And then I got another one for Delta Point Pro. And then the one that's installed is obviously for the RMR. Now let's talk about the iron sights because they're both great and then maybe not so great at the same time. Obviously, it's great that they include sights that you can use to co-witness with your red dot. I think that's amazing. I think any gun that comes with a modular optic system should include those. So the front sight has green tritium, but something special about this front sight is it's also photoluminescent, meaning if it gets charged with light, it will actually glow. Very few guns come with that from the factory. In fact, I don't know of hardly any that I've seen that come with that from the factory. If you know of a gun that comes with that from the factory, let me know down in the comments. I usually only see that on Trijicon HDs and I think some of the XS F8 sights have that. Aside from that, I haven't seen it on too many sites. The rear sight is where a lot of the controversy comes in because it is a U-notch. And U-notches are a love it, hate it type deal. Some some people like it because they feel like the front sight rests down in there a lot easier. Some people hate it. For me, I can take it or leave it. I'm more accurate with a squared off rear notch, but because these are backups to the red dot, it's not the biggest deal in the world. The other thing that's great about this is on a lot of handguns like Glocks, M&Ps, or the P320s is they have reversible magazine releases but they don't have fully ambi magazine releases. The only other gun that I think I have right now that is truly fully ambi is the CZ P10C. And as I mentioned earlier, they kind of stole some of the design features of the CZ P10C, and this has a fully ambi magazine release. Speaking of the magazines, the mags that are included with it, one is a 17 and one is a 20, and the 20 has an extension. However, some people had some problems with these when they were first released, and let me show you why. One thing I want you guys to pay attention to is this little metal plate that's right here. When the first batch of these went out and people were talking about their magazines exploding. So what happened when these went out was this little plate that you see on the outside of the magazine on the extension. So there was a couple things that happened. Number one, in the box that was included for the people for testing, they included another magazine extension for this mag. And people were installing these and some people installed them incorrectly. Then a couple other guys that I talked to that made YouTube videos about this, theirs was installed incorrectly from the factory. So if you do pick one of these up, just double check your extended mag, make sure that metal plate is on the outside. If it's not, take it apart, and put it back together the correct way. So now that I've kind of dumped a ton of product knowledge on you, the ultimate question is how the heck does this dang thing shoot? So right now we are between five and 600 rounds that I have put through here using both magazines. And I am happy to report that I've had no problems with this at all. And like I said, I, the only problem that people were having before had to do with that mag extension and them being installed incorrectly either by the user or from the factory. However, mine was installed correctly. And so all 500 rounds went through this without a single hitch. I do wanna give a big shout out to the guys at Badlands Ammo for hooking us up with ammo to do the testing and review. I do have some special things available for you at the parts list that take off a pretty good chunk of change on things. So there's more info at the parts list about that, but thank you to those guys for providing the ammo. So the first thing I noticed when I went out to shoot this was there was a little bit of a learning curve um, when you first start shooting it. Shooting a ton of different guns, whether it be Glocks or M&Ps, you know, every gun has a different feel to it. And this one did as well, but the, it didn't take but maybe two mags and I started getting used to it. And as soon as I got used to this, I started noticing that I could get a pretty good cadence going with it. And that's pretty good for a factory gun. Not only was I able to get a pretty good cadence with it, you know, getting like multiple shots on target accurately at a pretty good pace, but I was also able to do transitions. I had three targets set up and I would kind of switch. I'd, sometimes I'd go left to right or right to left, or sometimes I'd go right, left and stuff like that. And I noticed that with the cadence with this, I was able to time it perfectly so that there wasn't any gaps between my shots when I was transitioning to targets.
Once I got used to that, I found this gun not only easy to shoot fast, I found it easy to shoot fast accurately. However, there was one thing I did notice about this gun that I haven't really noticed in other polymer pistols except for one. I noticed that the felt recoil on this was a little bit harsher than what I'm used to. What I mean by that is if you look at the slow motion footage, it doesn't look like it's recoiling any more than any other gun. But it's almost like when the slide comes all the way back, I just feel like it's sending a little bit of a shock down into the grip and into your hand. And I don't know if it's maybe a little bit undersprung. I don't think so, but it's just something different. Now, one gun that is notorious for that is the HK VP9. I don't know what it is about this gun. I've had the slide lightened. I've added a thumb ledge on here, but ever since I got this gun, it's a really snappy gun to shoot, whether it's factory or whether it's modified. And I don't know why. I've tried to fix it, haven't been able to, need to add some ports to it in the future. This one was nowhere near as bad as the VP9, just slightly more than say a Glock 17. I think once more people try this gun out, I'm not gonna say it will do this, but I think it has the potential to, I think, have some people jump ship from the P320s, maybe even jump ship from a P10C or jump ship from a Glock, just because it has all of the best features from each of those guns melded into one. The other great thing about this is Springfield is supporting this with upgrades already from the factory. They have a threaded barrel kit that's available if you wanna run suppressors or a compensator on it. They have also seen that they have a plate for it so that you can run a red dot on it that uses the Aimpoint Acro footprint. That would be the only optic that this would actually need to use a plate on. And earlier I said, I do think there will be some aftermarket triggers available for this. And the reason I'm saying that is because Apex Tactical has already already came out with a stainless steel guide rod for these. And because we know that really went in deep on the Springfield Hellcat and developing triggers, now I am assuming at this point, I think they're gonna make a trigger for this one. Not that this trigger is bad, but we all know that Apex makes everything better. There's also other grip modules available. Um, as of right now, I haven't seen any colors available you know, from the factory. Obviously you could Cerakote them. So I'm hoping that in the future, they'll come out with different colored grips and maybe the aftermarket will start coming out with grip modules and some other upgraded parts for these as well. Now I do hope that they come out with a compact version of this, this is the Glock 17 size. I do hope they come out with a Glock 19 size. Now I know that the Hellcat exists, but the Hellcat is a different platform. So I'd like to see an Echelon Compact. Hopefully that's coming soon. And I think that would be the perfect gun because to me, I just love the Glock 19 size, regardless of the brand of gun that it comes in. So the next logical question is, what about holster compatibility? You know, in the past, I've been able to take guns like, you know, the CZ P10Cs and the Glock 19s and Glock 17s, and a lot of their holsters were kind of interchangeable. However, with this one, although the overall size and feel of it is very close to a Glock 19 or very close to an MMP or very close to a CZ, I couldn't get it to fit with any of the holsters. Now, if you've had a different experience, let me know down in the comments because you might have a different brand holster than I do. I have a few different brands, but my favorite is tier one concealed. So the exception to the rule on this one is this guy. This is the tier one MSP holster. You can get these with or without the Mag Caddy. These are appendix carry holsters, and this fits any gun that has a Surefire X300 on it. And this one has a Surefire X300, and it fits perfectly and beautifully. So if you wanna know more about these holsters, I'll have more information over at the parts list so you can check these guys out. And the main holsters that I carry nowadays anyway are from tier one. And I have a lot of reasons why, which I won't go into detail on this video because I have dedicated videos for that. But that's the only holster that I could get it to fit is you either gotta get a dedicated holster for it or you get one of these universal holsters. So how do I actually feel about the Springfield Echelon? I think they knocked it out of the park, at least in my experience with the sample size of one that I've had, I think it's a great gun. I think it's not overpriced, you know, 600 bucks on the street price, about 600 to 650, depending on where you get it. I'll have more info at the parts list for you. Everything that they melded together from other guns came out to, to be something that actually is functional and works very well. Knowing what I know now about this, I would, go out and spend my own money on one of these if I was in the market for another full-size handgun. But I guess the question now is, would I choose this over say a Glock or a CZ or an MMP or a P320? 
Of the handguns that I've tested so far this year, this might be one of the best ones, and here's why. If I was looking to buy a gun to carry, whether OWB or IWB, let's just say, if I was gonna get a Glock, the Glock is gonna need some things for me personally. I'm not saying you would need this, but I'm gonna need to do some things to that Glock before I'm ready to carry it. It's definitely gonna need better sights. It's definitely gonna need a better trigger, probably an Apex because those are approved by various police departments or an Overwatch Precision. And then it's gonna need some grip work. Most of the Glocks that I like to carry need grip work on them. I do like to get a good texture on there because my hands tend to sweat a lot, so I need a lot of extra texture compared to other people. In addition to that, you know, you can get an MOS Glock, you know, so you can have modular optics. They're about 650, I believe, for MOS Glock. And then I have to do those little tweaks to make it where I want to carry it. Now on the CZP 10 cs one thing I will say about these guys is lately these bad boys have come way down in price. I think these were about $500 back in 2018 when I picked this one up. Nowadays, a basic P10C, I've seen them for like 350 bucks. I mean, brand new out of the box. And that's a really good deal, especially for a P10C. However, with a P10C, for me to carry it, it still needs upgrades. The first upgrade it's definitely gonna need is better grip texture. The other thing is if I was gonna get a CZ P10C, I would try my best to find the optics ready version, which are a lot harder to find. And then once you find the optics ready version, they don't include any of the optics plates. So you have to go buy those separately. And so that's not the biggest deal in the world, but because you gotta go out and do all that, why not just get something that already has all that? In regards to P320s, nope, not carrying it. Number one, I'm just not naturally good with a P320 and I've never have been. But even if I was, they've had too many cases of not being drop safe and they've had too many cases of them just going off in people's holsters. I'm not gonna carry one, nor would I recommend that you carry one. If you're watching this video and you carry one, Good for you. What about the M2.0? Now, this is a newer version of the M2.0 that comes with suppressor height sights. And as of recently, the newer models, whether they're the metal one like this one or the polymer, have an upgraded trigger from the factory. And these can be had for like $540. And this has basically everything that I want in a gun. It has modular optics, it comes with suppressor height sights from the factory, has a really good grip texture, has a really good trigger. However, just because it has all the things that I look for in a handgun, it might not have all the things that you might want in a handgun. For example, maybe you want that modularity so you can get different sized grips or different textured grips or grips with different ergos. With this gun, that won't be available. Maybe you want a gun that has ambidextrous magazine release. With this gun, that won't be available. Additionally, maybe you want a gun that has a thumb rest to help you mitigate recoil when you're shooting. With this gun, it doesn't have that available. I mean, there is a takedown lever there, but it's pretty slippery. It doesn't really work well for pressing down the muzzle. And I say that because right now these guns, when they came out, they were 650. I've been seeing them online for 599. These, I've been seeing them online for about 540 to 550. So about 50 or $60 more, you get a lot more for your money. So in my humble opinion, versus all the other guns that we just talked about, this one actually does come with more features for the price point. Now, whether those features are valuable to you or me, that's all subjective. I'm not saying it's better than an m and I'm not saying it's better than a P10C. I'm not saying it's better than any gun. I'm simply just showing you what the features are for the price point. And in my opinion, you get more for the money with this one. Now, obviously there's other guns out there like Canix and stuff that I haven't tested yet that come with a lot for the money as well. So let me know what your thoughts are down in the comments section below. And if you want to see a video on why you should avoid metal framed handguns, then check out this video right here because I go into a lot of detail on good, the bad, and the ugly of metal framed handguns. But until next time, guys, I love you. You guys stay sexy.